This presentation is part of a project called Rethinking Restoration. We are doing this with a number of partners, including FACS, to find new and innovative approaches to improve restoration practice and the outcomes. The goal of this project is to find ways to break intergenerational cycles of disadvantage and engagement with the child protection system through taking a restoration lens. This included a year of research with actors across the child protection system, frontline staff, families and decision makers. As a result of that research, we co-designed a new service and practice opportunities with FACS. This included a new co-parenting model of foster care. One stream of this project is focusing on case practice and that will be the main focus of this presentation today. We were inspired by a casework team who was able to flip restoration success rates from 25% success to 85% success. We sought out to understand what enabled this kind of practice and these outcomes for families. We've spent the past several months working closely with casework teams to understand and think about the conditions required in order to help exceptional and innovative practice to flourish and to focus on what this means for working with Aboriginal families in restoration. We did this in many, many different ways. We spent time with families, NGO service providers and also a number of FACS staff. We interviewed people and did what we called generative research and paper prototyping in order to learn from multiple stakeholders. This included spending time with CSEs and also spending time with the Winning Gay team. Some of you might know this organisation as the one that has developed and trained in an innovative approach to Aboriginal kinship care assessment. Through these processes, we explored a number of different questions and three in particular. The first question that we wanted to explore was, what are the conditions that foster exceptional case restoration and Aboriginal practice at individual team and systems level? Secondly, what enables staff to adopt, apply and maintain practices that foster good outcomes? Thirdly, what would it take to spread, share and scale conditions that enable exceptional casework? We also wanted to do this through thinking about what that would mean through what we call an Aboriginal cultural lens. So what is an Aboriginal lens? And what is a lens? When you look through it, it can change the way something looks. It can magnify something or it can make something clearer. If you put light through it, it can break it up into its multitude of colours. In short, it can help you to see something differently and more clearly. Today I want to highlight three aspects of an Aboriginal cultural lens. Firstly, this can help us to look at the world differently. Secondly, it can give us a sense of having a genuine empathy for the people that we are working with, a connection, being in someone's shoes. And finally, what this can help us with, this lens, is to practice from the point of view of someone else. So, given all of that, and what an Aboriginal cultural lens is, I now want to take you through some of the key insights that we had, five key insights. I will be taking you through each of these with a specific focus on working with Aboriginal families. I'll be sharing stories and messages from my own personal experiences and my learnings over years of working in the public sector and also in other organisations. And what I'll be doing is giving you an opportunity to actually reflect on these insights. What do they mean to your practice, your day-to-day -day work? I'll be giving you space to have a think about that today. So the first insight that I want to focus on is applying new practices requires unlearning old ones. So what does that mean in terms of your practice? So I thought first that I would take you through a story. An experienced colleague of mine spoke to me about a home visit that they did with an Aboriginal family. I'll call her Mia. They went with a new caseworker who had just started. Part of this visit was going to be including an Aboriginal elder of which the mother Mia knew about. And she felt incredibly embarrassed about this because she didn't have a lot of food in the home. She barely even had enough mugs or plates. Whilst the new caseworker had been told to maintain boundaries in visits, and felt uncomfortable about bringing food into Mia's house. 
the team brought cake into the mum's home. This enabled the mother to actually host an elder respectfully and feel that she could do that in a way that was giving and open. And what was so important about this was that that meant that she didn't have to feel any shame about the experience that she had. So much of what we do is influenced by our personal experiences, our lives and the ways we've been treated by our family, in our professional setting, and also we learn so much through education and other experiences. And this can, while risk whilst be very important, can have an impact on the way in which we do things sometimes. We actually have to apply what we learn to all different types of contexts, which means that whilst we've learned something, we might have to do it differently and unlearn some of those things sometimes. The second insight is people are more likely to make change when supported by someone that they trust. As I mentioned earlier, the FBIF program is a model that I was involved with and is a peer-to-peer -peer program that we matched families. We matched those that are going through tough times with those that have been through tough times and come out the other end. At one point, we matched an Aboriginal family, I'll call her Beth, with a non-Aboriginal sharing family called Jazz. The Aboriginal family was not one that trusted easily because of her personal experiences and the things that she had been through all her life. It was very traumatic and a very difficult life. To change this, the sharing family had to be persistent. She never gave up on her. She called over and over again. She rocked up at her house, came with food, called again, until she found a way to connect with Beth. When that connection was made, it was then that trust was built. And it was then at that point that Beth was able to make positive changes in her life. I've heard of a number of times in my career that many professionals do have some fears about working with Aboriginal people and hence building the trust needed for behaviour change. This can be because they may not know much about the local Aboriginal community or they have tried something before and for some reason have made mistakes and got growled at by the community or elders. I've certainly ha had that happen to me. It's really important to understand that we all make mistakes and that mostly community members and Aboriginal people will give us the flexibility and space to learn. Part of this is about being humble, saying sorry when you need to, and always sitting back and listening. So our third insight was what systems do to people, people do to people. I remember being a new worker many years ago. I had just started with an organisation and I happened to be in the vicinity when a manager was speaking incredibly rudely to another staff member. She was really demeaning and, and put her down. And the only thing I can remember thinking was that I was glad that it wasn't me. The other things that I found out about was that that team in general did not treat others well either. So they were not respectful to families and they were not respectful to carers and not always with children either. If we want to build services that really care and heal others, we have to make sure that we role model as leaders treating each other well. So the fourth insight is having the right supports at the right time. A colleague of mine in Adelaide, Curtis, is a cultural consultant for youth justice and I asked him once what he thought needed to be different in working with Aboriginal people. He said working with Aboriginal people can look like a different way of working, a different way of seeing things, or it could be the same thing with different steps. Thinking about how we find the right supports at the right time for families means we can't be static in the way we think. Context and the situation of families changes all the time. So we actually have to think about how we adapt our services. And a very key consideration is around that for Aboriginal families is what those cultural needs will be at the right time. The fifth and final insight that we had was that belief systems about possibility and our role in change can be facilitators or barriers. 
once I heard from a caseworker in this work, when I believe people can change, they can change. As part of our learnings, we heard that from a very experienced caseworker who had a lot of hope for the people that she worked with. And also, this is a fundamental goal of the family by family program and belief. When I think about hope and hopelessness, so much of what we know as Aboriginal people is that things aren't going that well for us. When it comes to our own well-being, um, the chronic conditions that we might get, the number of people that are incarcerated and the number of children that are taken away from their families, sometimes, even for people like me, it can feel a little hopeless. So what's really important as professionals is that we find the small moments of hope for people. And what was so interesting in being out in the field with caseworkers is that it's not a big court outcome that gets them up in the morning or is the big thing that they're looking for. Actually, it's the small moments of hope. I heard stories of caseworkers that found amazing experiences when a father actually spoke to them properly without swearing at them. I heard them talk about young people and how just to get a hug or someone saying thank you gave them so much. And for me, what I'd like to really encourage in you is how you find those small moments of hope, those potential that you can actually see in others and actually help and encourage behaviour change in people. Thank you so much and if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to contact myself or Lauren Weinstein if you would like to talk further about anything that came up today.